welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Hello and welcome to How I Got Here, Mozio and Focuswire's weekly podcast about innovators in travel and transportation. Today we have Nicolas Brousson of BlaBlaCar. BlaBlaCar gained popularity as a platform for long distance carpooling, but is fast becoming the go-to platform for shared road travel. They've got a lot of diverse initiatives and investments, including an intermodal transport platform with SNCF, Blah Blah Bus, which originated from an acquisition of WeBus uh, that operates in 400 cities in Europe, and Blah Blah Ride, a partnership with Voy, the European scooter startup. Oh, and Blah Blah Line, a, commuting, uh, a commuter carpooling service as well. So thank you very, very much for joining us, Nicholas. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we like to start every one of these interviews off the same way, which is uh, for us to ask you how you got here. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, so, you know, I'll try not to tell you all about my life and, uh, and how I get there, but essentially I was probably not meant to do uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, I studied physics back in the, the late 90s in, uh, in France, uh, and I moved to the U.S. Uh, in 99, actually, to complete my master's degree and to do a PhD. Uh, and for those who worked back then or studied back then, it was during the dot com and telecom boom essentially of the late uh, the late nineties uh, so I ended up uh, in Berkeley uh, with most people actually not doing the PhD, not finishing their master degree and going into startups uh, uh, and back then, uh, literally I did not know about startups, venture capital, silicon valley stock option or all that all those buzzwords of you know this ecosystem that we know well today. And especially it was uh, very much foreign to Europeans or, or French people back in the late 90s. You know, there were very few startups, very few VCs uh, in Europe. So I ended up joining um, a, a pretty early stage startup in optical telecommunication. I had my background in optics and physics, um, which um, ended up raising from Kleiner Perkins and big VCs. Uh, and we had a pretty phenomenal ride from uh, raising tons of money, we raised eighty-five million dollar. Uh, we grew very fast. Then came nine eleven recession in two thousand two, and the whole thing got wiped out. And we had like a series of um, of layoff, uh, and the company went from essentially thirty people to one fifty to ten uh, within two years. Uh, but that's how I got into into startups and entrepreneurship. Um, so I spent seven years uh, in the Valley, uh, and then I wanted to go back to Europe. Uh, so it was around 2006, 2007, um, to do two things. A, to do more of that in Europe, because it was still pretty slow, uh, and also to get eventually to spend some time in venture capital. Um, so that's what I've done, and that's where I met Fred, actually, my co-founder, one of the, the three co-founders of Blah, Blah Car, actually, doing um, an MBA at, uh, at INSEAD. Um, and he had started this, uh, this website uh, called covoiturage.fr, which means carpooling.com, essentially. Uh, and I guess we, uh, A, we, I fell in love with the guy and his passion, and he was doing this thing as a side project back then. Uh, and it felt like you know, eBay of services. Uh, and again, it was pre, remember, 2006, pre-iPhone. Uh, Facebook was still a private network uh, just taking off. Uh, and we started to work on that, which you know, ended up being blah, blah, car and known as the sharing economy and all that stuff. Um, but we were pretty early, like 2006, 2007 was almost like two, three years too early uh, for this type of companies. So, so the start of blah, blah, car, and I'm sure we, we'll expand on that, was not a fast journey. It was like a long, painful ride initially from 2006 to the first funding in 2009 during the recession. Uh, you're leading to the more known stories of 2012 and beyond. So, you know, I, I got into startups like almost 20 years ago. Um, love it. Uh, and Blah Blah Car has been uh, you, the opposite of how you create a startup today. It was sort of slow and painful and very hard to raise money initially, uh, which doesn't feel like that these days or a lot less. Hi, Nicholas. It's uh, Kev here. Thanks ever so Hi, much Kevin. for joining us on uh, How I Got Here. Um, lots to pick apart there, I suppose. But I suppose 
the one question I have to kick us off really is where did the idea of carpooling and kind of automating that and almost digitizing that process come from? Yeah. That's, I guess that's the second part of a two part question. The first part is how did, cause it's kind of hitching in a way, isn't it? It's old school mm-hmm. hitchhiking. So yeah, yeah. talk us through that process from taking the hitching concept into carpooling and then deciding this is what we need to do. Because I think it's, it's yeah. just a fascinating way to, to start a business in the concept. Yeah, yeah. So, so it started in, in, in many ways, but I would say it started as a concept in, in Fred's brain, my co-founder, who actually was looking for a train for Christmas actually to go back to his family from Paris to Vendée, so it's on the west coast mm-hmm. of, uh, of France. And you know, all the trains were booked and he was like, okay, there must be a classified where uh, you know, I can find uh, some some guy actually driving there and I can contact that person and maybe just book a seat in this car. And there was, you know, we had like a website called Le Bon Coin, which is like the Craigslist of, uh, of France, if you like. And there was very few of that, actually. A few people were sort of hitchhiking, but it was seen as risky and reliable. Uh, you know, it was something from the, the, the 70s or, or the 60s, but not something people would do, actually. Uh, in uh, in 2005, 2006, 2007. Um, so he started to, to develop uh, a, a very simple website and that's that's when we met. And you're right, at the beginning, people saw that as hitchhiking. And it's been one of the big issues actually we had with, um, with Blah Blah Car in the early days. People saw that as hitchhiking and they thought like, hey, people don't do hitchhiking anymore. So <laughs> you guys are doing hitchhiking online, which is absurd because you do, you're trying to put something online that, People don't even do offline anymore. Uh, and the big thesis back then was offline to online. Again, like right now, we do a lot, a lot more stuff. It was e-commerce. It was all that stuff. And essentially, what we described was it's not hitchhiking. Essentially, through mobile and social network, we, we believed, and we believe still, we can create trust within a community and make that essentially like a much larger transport network that does that's not about hitchhiking. That's just about like you know, a trusted, reliable mean of transport, optimizing empty seats in cars. So if you see it this way, you have a completely different picture because you realize that uh, all over Europe, maybe all over the world, 80% of even long distance travel is done by car. So if you look at France, you look at Germany, you look at the UK, that's how people move around um, on distances between 50 and you know, 500 miles. So if you look at the empty seats in cars, that's actually the biggest seat inventory on earth. It's bigger than any seat inventory in planes, buses, and trains. And it's very poorly optimized because the car is private, it's not shared, the data is not shared, people don't trust each other, and so on. So we thought that's what we need to solve to create a transport network. But people saw that as, hey, you guys are doing hitchhiking online. Makes no sense. Um, and that's also why I was, I was mentioning how tricky it was to, to fundraise in the early days. Uh, and I remember like Fred and I actually uh, Pitching, it was the first time actually we had like a business presentation or a pitch, if you like. Um, so we pitched the business to a group of business angels um, at INSEAD uh, where we were doing our MBA. Uh, and the feedback was you know, very negative back then. You know, people told us like, hey, if you get 100,000 uh, 100, people to use your service in France, you guys get lucky and you get essentially all the bums to sign up on your website. And by the way, there is no business model. <laughs> so today we're close to 100 million people uh, having signed up globally in 22 countries, right? So we've yeah. gone a long way from the, if you get to 100K, you're lucky, we get to 100 million and, and we still almost, and we still, uh, and we go beyond that. Um, and, and the reason it took time is I, I think the ingredients um, that make actually the sharing economy and this sort of trusted network um, uh, element actually possible were not there yet, or at least they were not that visible. It was a mix of like mobile phones. So we were pitching that pre-iPhone. So it was before the iPhone came out. Uh, sure, you had smartphone, but it was more like Blackberry type um, smartphone, not like iPhone type smartphone. Um, Facebook was still pretty small. It was Facebook until 2006, if I'm not mistaken, was a private network for like you know, people from university and it just opened up around that date, I mean, give or take. Um, and essentially that's what we, I guess we saw is that social network plus smartphone would actually help create those, this trust uh, between people. 
and I would say it became, it's very funny how it works. It, it started to have a word uh, probably in 2010, and it was the sharing economy. And Airbnb raised money from Sequoia, and it became a thing. And suddenly, like the perception of investors changed radically overnight. Whereas for us, I would say in terms of usage of the platform and, and, and the growth story, it was like a continuous, it just suddenly money became available. Uh, but before it was like, yeah, you guys are doing hitchhiking. That's a weird thing to do. Uh, <laughs> to Wow, that's sharing economy for cars. That's huge. And, uh, and so it became. Um, but yeah. but it's, there was a bit of a disconnect between the, I would say, the user reality and the, and, and the investor world, which you know, overnight, I mean, not overnight, but within a year changed from, hey, it's hitchhiking. That's weird to, wow, it's sharing economy. That's cool. Um, yeah. And that helped us, I guess. Yeah. So, so Nicholas, um, First of all, go Bears. I went to Berkeley as well. Um, and after Berkeley, actually, I spent seven years in the Valley. And like every good Berkeley or Stanford graduate at some point applied to Y Combinator. And I remember hearing the statistic that the single most uh, submitted idea of all time at that time, which was seven or eight years ago, um, was a carpooling network to Y Combinator. And this was around 2010 when I graduated. So right around the time that you're talking about. And so there, you know, and I was told this in kind of like a, you know, cautionary tale that there are a lot of dead bodies in carpooling and you, yeah. you see this, you know, quite a bit, um, you know, Zim Ride, which is now Lyft, right, you know, was like they Absolutely. flailed around in America trying to do something similar and just didn't succeed. So, you know, it's kind of a two part question here. What was it about France or Europe in particular and or your approach that really broke through when, you know, when it was so many other failed? Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, it's almost, uh, the, the question is almost the, the opposite is, uh, or, or turned out to the opposite. What is it about the U.S. that made carpooling so hard to crack in the U.S. Uh, to some extent? Because today carpooling works in France, in Spain, in, you know, in Germany, so all over Europe, but it also works in Russia, in Ukraine, in Brazil, in Mexico, in, you know, in many, many different places. So we've been, uh, and it doesn't work so well in the U.K., by the way, interestingly, and we can get to that as well. I mean, within Europe, actually, UK works a lot less than uh, other countries outside. It's, uh, I, I think one of the reasons uh, it did not work in, uh, in the US is that the US doesn't have the first mile and last mile um, uh, urban transport, essentially, to get people to a car. So the way carpooling works, if you think of it, a driver is going to say, hey, I'm going to leave from that part of town, and I'll drop you off so in San Francisco, and I'll drop you off somewhere uh, in Los Angeles. But we always assumed, or at least this activity tends to assume that the passengers, the two, three, four guys actually sitting in the car, come from different location, and the driver is not going to taxi around Paris or Los Angeles to pick them up. It's, it's a nightmare to do that. So they need to find a way to do the first like two, three, four, five miles to get to the car, just like they would get to a train station or a bus station, then drive together and then be dropped off. And it turns out that Europe is great for that because Historically, we have trains and we have very good public transport and very affordable public transport in very sort of compact cities. Now, if, if you take my example of Los Angeles, if I tell you I'll drop you off somewhere in Los Angeles or even in the Bay Area, well, good luck. You know, if you want to go to Sunnyvale and I drop you off in Mountain View, how do you get between the two? Right. It's, it, it's a bit tricky. So and. Um, and that was the, 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 the single biggest problem, Zimride which ended up being lived with John and Logan, uh, faced actually back then. They had a few trips going from uh, Bay Area to Tao, but the issue is again, like no public transport in, on either end of that connection. Uh, and it felt, so that, that, that was the main, I think the main reason. The other one was your know, petrol prices are pretty cheap in, uh, in the US. So the cost of driving is a lot cheaper. So the incentive, the financial incentive to share is not as strong. Uh, but again, I think the first one is the, the most fundamental. Uh, and interestingly, it, it was one of the struggles for us to fundraise, by the way, because people, especially back then, were looking at European startups as doing something that was done in the U.S. a couple of years later uh, and trying to run faster than the U.S. company would expand into Europe, essentially. And, and people always looked at the U.S. You know, saying that, well, no one is doing carpooling in the U.S., so it validates the fact that hitchhiking is weird. <laughs> that that your company is never going to work because you know, usually things that work in Europe tend to have worked before uh, in the US. I think it's a bit less true today, uh, but but back then that was really the um, 
you know, the, the sort of the rationale of uh, of many investors. So, uh, and to date, actually, there are not many players doing carpooling at any scale in the U.S. Interestingly, so yeah. so it has not really taken off uh, as a thing in the U.S. How how did you in that early phase? almost kind of educate the market whether that's consumers or the investors that this was something that was uh, both um, more efficient and uh, safer than hitching so this was actually a proper carpooling service and get over those um, you know preconceptions that people have yeah there are a few things actually we've done pretty early on to really differentiate carpooling from hitchhiking um, so if you think of hitchhiking, it tends to be unscheduled. So it's just like historically, it's just a guy on the side of the road. Exactly. You put your thumbs up or, or you have like a cardboard saying whatever, like, you know, Paris or London or whatever. Yeah. Um, here it was different. It was really, you replicated the same behavior uh, you do when you book a, a train, a plane or, or anything. So you book a seat in advance and there is a price. So there is like a, an agreed price, an agreed value for that seat that the driver is going to decide on. Uh, and then we let essentially um, a community vetting taking place. So essentially as a passenger, you send a request uh, to a driver and the driver can accept or refuse uh, you in the car. But, but the main differences with hitchhiking were, well, three things. A, there is always a price. So whereas each hiking was this assumption of it's free or it's always awkward, essentially like it's an awkward discussion when you do each hiking, like should I pay, not pay, I, am I expected to pay? Um, it's unscheduled um, and the trust layer is non-existent because you just picked up someone from the side of the street. So essentially we solved for the price is transparent. There is a clear value for that seat uh, that you book. It's scheduled. You book that in advance. It can be very last minute, but you book that in advance very much the way. So it's the same behavior you pay online on a, on a website or an app. Um, and we've built, and that's the main thing, we've built the trust layer. And I often describe it this way. The, and still today, actually, the thing we work on the most is actually building trust and helping people match with each other. We don't manage a transport network. So if we take the example of, um, of the COVID crisis, carpooling just turned itself off. Like we did not choose to stop the network. People stopped carpooling because you know, everything was shut down. And it just restarted post COVID because people restarted carpooling, but we don't design a transport network. We don't decide where people go and when they go. So essentially our job is not to manage a transport network in a traditional sense. We don't deploy capacity. Our job is to manage essentially the best match and the best match is a function of time money and trust so essentially like we realize that as we gather more information on drivers and passengers and we start having like you know hundred of ratings an id verified we have the driving license of the driver uh, we have the license plate of the car and again like you know, tons and tons of ratings um, on the driver and passenger the match rate or the, or the ability to be accepted as a passenger in a car goes up and up and up uh, and you create that trusted network uh, which is quite unique so so we actually solve for trust and matching uh, not so much for what traditional transport company um, uh, worry about so i wanted to segue a little bit into kind of what some of your new initiatives are here because and i'm curious what your north star is with all these initiatives you could say it's these spare seats but you also now have buses and you could say it's shared transportation but you also now have scooters right and so um what is the what is the overarching mission and how has it evolved uh, from you know day one to where you are now for your company yeah i would say the north star is it's been the same for many years we we sort of sometimes change the way the the way we describe it but essentially we call that zero empty seats so, so essentially you know, we try to optimize inventory of car seats but also now bus seats and potentially we could do that on train seats so that essentially you maximize this inventory so that these vehicles end up being as full as possible which you know makes sense from a environmental point of view uh, because obviously you consume a lot less energy with a full car than you do with an empty car and economically so that's how you can actually democratize transport even more um, so and then over time we evolved from just doing carpooling and being known for you know essentially blah blah car and carpooling to realizing that actually we have this massive audience of passengers looking for rides from city a to city b 
And at the end of the day, what they look for is a solution from CTA to CTP or from point A to point B. It might be a car, it might be a bus, it might be a train and then a blah, blah car, it might be you know, a combo of all of that. Uh, and because we, in a way, we have, you know, we say we're lucky to have this massive audience and super qualified, trusted audience, um, it was pretty easy for us to start adding more supply, i.e. buses, and eventually we'll probably add trains and start to connect this broader network uh, and offer actually more um, uh, to, to, to our passengers. So that's what we're doing. Blah, blah, right, I would say is more of an experiment, like an in-city experiment. Uh, today, it's a bit on the side of that broader mission. Uh, the main point here is to connect our world, which is more like an intercity world, with the in-city world, right? So, so today, I would say we stop existing when people do you know, zero to five miles. Like, you know, typically we exist when people go 20 miles to a thousand miles. So, so we wanted to, especially in France, like now we're doing this, uh, uh, this test with Void on, on Baba Ride, uh, eventually maybe doing bikes, but we, we want to connect people to the first and last mile uh, in the city. Very interesting. Um, so, you know, I, I think you, if, if I'm not mistaken, you guys have kept all your apps separate. Um, and so I kind of wanted to actually touch on that as a general business strategy because yep. I feel like super app is the, the, uh, the, you know, the fashionable thing these days for people to be, be thinking about and you've actually kind of somewhat eschewed that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, maybe give me some details for like how you're thinking about, about that from a business perspective. Yes, yeah, so, so, so it's, it's more of a, a way we get there than an ambition, right? So. Uh, so blah, blah, car obviously was one app, a uh, single app. We don't have like a different app for drivers, passengers, and use cases. Um, we went into buses by m and so, so we ended up uh, you know, essentially getting like a new app, which was WeBus, that we rebranded blah, blah, bus. We get a new app called Bus4 in Russia and Ukraine that does buses. The goal is to bring all of that onto blah, blah, car. So essentially anything that's mid-long distance, and that's kind of my obsession right now, has to be reintegrated into a single app. Uh, so we have this one app obsession right now in the company. Um, and within a year, it's all gonna be integrated into, into one app. Um, so, so that's for all the, the buzz business. It's scattered today, I would say, not by accident, but by construction of an m and process to get, to get there. Uh, when it comes to uh, what we've done with urban uh, carpooling, blah, blah lines, it was different, it was indeed a choice. Uh, because we realized that the way you crack commuting, so maybe I should step back, but essentially on carpooling, we have two slightly different products. Um, one for mid-long distance, which tends to solve like people going on weekends, uh, holiday, short breaks. Um, so typically you're know, driving 100 to 500 miles. So it's like you going from Paris to the Alps or, or whatnot. Um, and we also have like a new app that we launched roughly a year ago uh, that's meant to solve your daily commute. So going from home to work, uh, driving, which is what you know, 80% of people do actually. So, so we, we tend to think when we live in cities like you know, San Francisco, Paris, or London, that people take the, the tube or the metro to go to work. At, 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 the, at the nation scale, it's not true. It's actually three quarter of the population use their car. It's close to 80% actually use their car to go to work and it's highly inefficient because the car is for the most part empty. Um, so in that case, we decided to develop a separate app so that we, we could play freely on the product paradigm because we realized that the, the schedule model uh, and the way you book a long distance journey to go on a weekend is fundamentally different from the way you think of your daily commute that you're going to repeat every day. So we don't want to be stuck with the, the booking platform and the product paradigm of blah, blah, car. And we wanted to think freely within another app. It might converge long term. But, but, but essentially, you need to realize if you, if you launch a side product on your existing product, you're very often going to be stuck with some product paradigm which you defined on the initial product. So, so again, like if you want to do like a, a city mapper on train line, it might be tricky, actually. Those are different use cases, and, 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 and you realize that actually the product looks very different. Uh, so today, blah, blah lines looks, look very different from, um, from blah, blah car. Long term all the supply, so essentially all the trips and, and we'll build API between the apps and blah, blah, car is meant to be that, that sort of like uh, go-to app uh, for all the trips, yes. So one more from me until I hand it back over to, to Kevin. Um, you know, 
there's been a lot of interesting stuff happening the last five to 10 years in long distance transportation in, in Europe. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I think you're probably, you know, potential arch nemesis here is, is uh, Flixbus. Uh, and, you know, uh, that was prompted by the liberalization of the German bus market. And mm -hmm. they went and, you know, snatched up a lot of European bus competitors and, you know, they come into here in New York, for example. Um, I'm curious how you mentioned a couple acquisitions in, in Ukraine and Russia. Um, how have you thought about expansion? Clearly, you bought WeBus off of SNCF. Um, and, you know, and I know you guys are in 400, 400 cities around Europe. Like, how have you thought about the network effects uh, of expansion and, and your M&A process for kind of uh, solidifying kind of like a use case uh, that can compete nationally or internationally with a Flixbus? Yeah. So, so, so maybe a couple of questions within, uh, within that. I mean, the, in terms of expansion and m and strategy, we had two very d distinct phases, essentially. We had, we had one from 2012 to probably 2016 or 17, and it was all about global expansion. So essentially, we had a, a great product, carpooling, so blah, blah, car, um, working well in France, starting to work well in Spain, and we realized that, okay, no one is doing that pretty much anywhere in the world, in Europe and outside of Europe, and we get to try as many markets as we can. So essentially, we had this first phase of M&A, and if you look at all the M&A we've done from 12 to 16, it was essentially like Equa hiring teams locally in, you know, in different markets. We've done that in Russia, we've done that in Poland, we've done that in Italy, we've done that in Mexico, um, and it was just about speed. So, so the M&A strategy was, was essentially like, if, we, if it goes faster to buy than build, we're gonna buy, fix, upgrade, change, uh, but we want it to be first in all these markets because uh, if you look at the blah, blah car model, it actually behaves like a classified bit like a, in terms of it's a C2C marketplace where very quickly you have millions of drivers sharing with millions of passengers. And it's truly, we, we often abuse this, um, this concept, but it's truly a winner take all model. You know, a bit like a, um, a Gumtree or, uh, or Craigslist and so on. Once you get there, it's very hard for competition to get in and C2C marketplaces tend to be this way. Um, so that was the first phase. Uh, then second phase started not long ago, actually in 2017. It was what I just described earlier. It was recognizing that now you have like close to, I mean, today we have 90 plus million members. Um, and actually they come with no marketing. They come because of the brand and the community. And you realize that actually we could build much more by starting to connect buses and trains onto the same platform and just expand if you like the share of wallet of those users by offering more mean of transport. So since 2017, the strategy has been more of a product expansion strategy. So if you look, we launched no new countries since 2017 and we acquired no, essentially no company in other countries. It was all about product expansion. So we acquired two bus company, we acquired like a short distance carpooling company, and it was you know, meant to just add supply. So, and that's what we're doing. So we are in that phase of sort of like product expansion or offer expansion. Um, and um, yeah, and that's what, we, that's what we, we're doing now essentially. So it's more like, and maybe I should say that, but M&A should always fit your dominant strategy. So you should never use M&A for sort of tactical move or, or operational improvements. So, so essentially, you, if your core, if, you, if, if the obsession of the company is to go international, m and should support that. If the core obsession of the company is to build more supply and, and become multimodal, m and should support that. And, uh, and that's, been, uh, um, that's been our story. We've done about 10 uh, acquisitions actually in the last seven years, I think. You saying going international reminds me of a question that perhaps I should have asked a bit earlier on, but uh, yeah. In those early days when you were branching out from France into other countries in Europe, what kind of, um, if any, regulatory difficulties did you face? Um, that's the, I guess that's the first question. And the second one is, you know, and, and I know a lot of the, 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 the concept is around the ratings of the driver and the ratings of the passenger. So they're, they're seen as good passengers and good drivers. But in that really early phase, you don't have many ratings. So was there a, a sense of nervousness that something might go wrong to a really terrible extent, whether it is for a passenger or a driver? So yeah, just yeah. kind of talk us through how you kind of dealt with that as a, as a founding team, as well as the, any kind of regulatory issues that you had to get over. 
Yeah, regulation has been, uh, it's been interesting because essentially we are true C2C marketplace. Uh, and, um, and the way it works is drivers do not make a profit. And in pretty much any country where we went, there is a pretty good definition of what's making a profit. So if you go to, to the US, it's going to be you know, the IRS. So it's going to be uh, HMRC in the UK saying, yep. hey, if you make more, so I'll take the UK as an example, since you're in the UK, but HMRC would tell you, if you make more than 40, I think 40 or 45 pence per mile with your car, you are making a profit. If you're making less than 40 or 45 pence, I can't remember, per mile, actually you're sharing the cost of your vehicle. So it's like the cost of your petrol you put in the vehicle, depreciation of the vehicle, insurance, and so on and so on. And essentially we always operated uh, below that bar of 40 or 45 pence per mile in the UK and same thing in Germany, Spain, France, and so on and so on. So, and it's been pretty fundamental, especially uh, at the time where Uber uh, was launching things like you know, um, Uber X, Uber Pop, and they were launching this sort of C2C Uber. And it became like a, a, you know, a massive regulation issue uh, in most countries because people said, well, that's illegal taxi. It's just like a guy with a car transporting people uh, professionally. It turns out that you know, on carpooling, if you do that for long distance, you can actually rationally stay below that threshold. Because if you think of 45 pence per mile, it means you know, London, Manchester is like 200 miles. Yeah. So, so actually it means you can collect as much as 90 pounds to go from London to Manchester. And you can get like four uh, passengers paying roughly 20 pounds per passenger. And it's still pretty good money, right? It means if you do a round trip as a driver to Manchester, you could collect as much as 90 pounds on the way to Manchester, as much as 90 pounds on the way back. Uh, and all of that being below that threshold of making a profit. And it's been one of the fundamental difference, I guess, between your ride sharing or what's been called ride sharing, which is Uber, Lyft, and all these sort of like um, in-city uh, ride yeah. hailing uh, activity and what we do. Uh, and I've, I, I guess thanks to that, actually, we've been immune to a lot of regulatory issues uh, in cities and, uh, and in countries. Um, and it's true that it's not like a sort of an untold story, but we, we had very few issues. Um, and so far, we've won every lawsuit we had. So we had like a couple of lawsuits in, uh, in Russia. We had a couple of lawsuits in Spain, actually uh, trying to make um, that like are illegal or more regulated. And it always failed essentially on that basis, on the fact that actually drivers don't do that as a professional activity. They would do that trip anyway with an empty car. And they're making an amount of money that's below uh, that, 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 that threshold of you know, the average cost of using the car. Um, and the beauty of it is we've built the entire activity below that threshold. And generally, it's again, it's a C2C and not a B2C um, activity. So if you take a black car, the driver is never going to be a professional guy uh, driving around with a van between London and Manchester. It's just going to be a genuine driver uh, that happens to go to Manchester for X, Y, Z reason. I, I, I'm, I'm interested. You said very early on in our conversation about, you know, investors didn't really get it. And then all of a sudden the sharing economy just kind of blew mm -hmm. up in around 2010. Do you think you've been given enough credit for being a part of that, given that so much attention is given to the likes of Airbnb and Uber and Lyft and and, and, and brands like that, because one, you were around before all those folk and two, it is ultimate sharing economy, isn't it? It's people that are doing yeah. it, as you say, not profit, but you're rarely mentioned in the same breath. Yeah, no, yeah it's, I, I think we get lots of credit for that, knowing we don't operate in the U.S., Right. So, so, right. So I think if you look at the yeah. if you look at the the number of mentioned uh, mentioned we have in uh, in U.S. press when they talk about the sharing economy and so on for a service that does not even exist in the U.S. that you know, U.S. consumers cannot even try, um, I, I think it's pretty good. In Europe, um, you know, whether it's in France, in Spain, in, in Germany, it's, it's really well known, actually. So, I mean, just because you have millions of people using it, it's a lot less used uh, in the UK and absent in, uh, in the US. So I think that's why uh, in, in English-speaking press, you have a bit of a brand deficit because we don't have a consumer reality in those countries. And I think it's pretty hard. It's, it's the same way, like, 
companies like Alibaba have been around and they're huge and people have been discovered that Alibaba is a giant company just a couple of years <laughs> ago because and even yeah. if you walk around the US or or Europe and you talk about Alibaba or Tencent or these companies no one really knows so so, so you know, the lack of consumer reality in the US um, probably did that on the investor side um, it was not the case so 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 since I would say 2013 or 14, we've been on the radar of the U.S. investors. Yeah. Um, so it really changed around that time. So, so I really saw that as a uh, as a very interesting a European play, and very quickly we also saw, saw that as a very interesting emerging market play uh, because we had launched many countries outside of uh, of Europe, so Russia, Brazil, Mexico, and so on. And it was kind of an interesting play in that sense. Uh, just uh, a quick one for me before David uh, comes back again. I mean. Uh, the Webus acquisition from uh, SNCF. I mean, was that a difficult one to do because it was from a, you know, uh, such a large organization, a state owned, part state owned company and all those kind of things. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you could think just don't go there because it's going to be an absolute nightmare. But obviously it was just strategic and good thing to do. But just the mechanics of that acquisition, I suspect, maybe caused a little bit of perspiration on the forehead there. Yeah, no, 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 it was. I mean, it was not an obvious deal to do. And uh, and I'll get back to that in a sec. But maybe you, if we pause a minute on, you, I guess, the importance of uh, tech and internet players, I think the the evolution of the bus market in Europe is a prime example. So yeah. you, the, yeah. that market liberalized, as you said, like five, six years ago, not even. Um I think if if you and I had that discussion five years ago, we would have said like, well, you know, it's going to be um, a first group from the UK or Megabus uh, is going to move in and then it's going to be SNCF and Dutch Aban and those companies are going to dominate uh, this bus market because that's just a matter of extension to trains. If you look at now in Europe, essentially five or six years later, just looking at the bus market, you have two companies le- uh, left standing. It's Flixbus and us. Right. And that's two companies that essentially did not operate a single bus or a single train five or six years ago. So we began from carpooling. They started Flixbus from, um, on, on that promise. And that's pretty interesting how it shifted. You know, if you want like symbols of, okay, the, the world is shifting towards those platforms and those internet companies. It's just because the, the model was more flexible. We don't own the bus. We don't um, hire directly the bus driver. It's a much more flexible model. So those two companies dominate. Um, so having said that, so for us, the way to enter this market was either we build from scratch. Um, so it was two years ago when we, we started to look at, uh, at Weibo. So we go by acquisition. And in fact, the only company um, that, that, that was interesting, at least in France, was Weibo. Uh, and initially, uh, we didn't even think about that because we thought like, okay, acquiring a company from SNCF makes no sense. They're not going to want to sell, number one. And number two, it feels like a, like a headache. And uh, and it came almost by accident that we we, we met with the guys from Webus and uh, and they told us like well um, SNCF has changed uh, its strategy and uh, and essentially they want to sell all the non train assets um, and Webus uh, you know, eventually Webus is going to have to go um, and we thought like wow okay. Um, that's interesting because you would think of SNCF maybe, I mean, you could fantasize about an SNCF buying a blah, blah, car, not blah, blah, car buying stuff from SNCF, especially in the, in the, the tiny French market. It feels a bit awkward. Um, and that's what happened. So, so we engage with, um, uh, with them and yes, we ended up uh, buying that. Strategically, it makes tons of sense. I always describe it this way, this m very interesting. Strategically, it made, makes tons of sense. Culturally, you would say, you know, it's a French company. We are French HQ, so it's easy. But actually, culturally, it was a massive gap, right? Because you end up with uh, people from SNCF, um, and uh, and they had to adjust. We had to adjust, and uh, and there was some obviously heavy lifting uh, in the first six to twelve months, essentially. Uh, you adapting processes and the way we work versus the way SNCF worked. So so culturally, it's been one of the most challenging MA we've done. We knew it moving in, uh, so it was kind of the, the cost of it. And, and that's often what people forget about M&A. They, they tend to be overly focused on strategy and finance, as they should. They tend to miss the, the post-merger integration 
um, side of things, which is like very much HR and people. Um, so so we, we had to invest a lot, essentially, like you know, creating common grounds, common culture, common processes uh, over the last um, the last twelve months. But now it's mostly actually uh, behind us. But yes, it was uh, it was an interesting experience. I, I would say, Dave. Dave? Nico, so I wanted to touch a little bit on something you said earlier as well, which is you you joke that most people view European startups as uh, people just trying to get a head start on an idea that's already worked in in America. Mm-hmm. Um, and I liked how you phrased that. It was it wasn't like, well, uh, how do you make carpooling work in France? Is how why doesn't carpooling work in America? And I and I think you know I think that that's changing. I think you kind of just mentioned that. Like I know that the, the, you mentioned Alibaba, and and I think that in tech circles there's a lot of obsession about analyzing Chinese companies like Pinduoduo mm-hmm. and others these days, and they're like, why did they work in China? And like, what does that mean for X in America or in Europe? And I feel like the lesson for me from that is that eventually, you know, we're all the same. We may have certain cultural differences and regulatory differences that lend to certain regions to be more primed for certain models to mm-hmm. arise. But in general, we almost always revert to, you know, doing the same stuff. Challenger banks is kind of another uh, you know, example. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a philosophical question here. How do you conquer the U.S. market? Like theoretically, if not now in a few years, what either has to change in the U.S. market or what in your strategy has to change to actually make carpooling and blah, blah, car successful in the U.S.? Yeah, it's it's a it's a very good one. Uh, so I agree with you. I, I don't think you know, carpooling is never going to work in the U.S. I I think the product we've built uh, initially was not the right product for the U.S. Uh, and the U.S. was probably more complicated to crack, and no one has cracked it. So for me, it's a good proof that it's not that simple because you know, it's the country of startups and venture capital and entrepreneurship. So if it was easy to crack, it could have been cracked. Uh, it doesn't mean it's never going to be cracked, and and in fact. You know, I think the new product uh, we launched just a year ago uh, in France, Blah Blah Lines, which is you know, carpooling applied to commuting, makes a lot more sense for the US actually, right? Because a lot of people commute by car in pretty long distances actually in the US. So there is a lot of action uh, in commuting and it's a lot easier to do like a true door-to-door on commuting because you know, people... Uh, connect, they meet, uh, and then you create some sort, sort of like teams of people that start sharing along 101, for example, in the, in the Bay Area. So, so I think it could be like um, commuting and short distance carpooling could be a very interesting entry point into, into the US. You know, having said that, there are a few companies actually. There's a company called Scoop uh, in uh, in the Bay Area. I was about um, to ask uh, about them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I haven't tracked recently. We had great discussions with, uh, I mean, essentially, there are not that many carpooling companies, so we end up knowing each other. Um, but uh, Rob and John have done like a, a great job actually cracking that use case of commuting um, in uh, in the Bay Area, uh, and I think even beyond now. Um, I don't know how big it got to you and, and, and where they are exactly, but I think they have like a nice business model. They get some good traction. Um, I, I think that's probably the way to crack the U.S. market. Um, you know, let's see also what's going to happen like post-COVID. We see the, the, the COVID crisis has probably slowed down all of this shared transport. I mean, for us and, uh, and for buses and planes and trains. Um, so let's see how it's going to bounce back in 2021. I think 2020 is this bizarre year where it's hard to track like who's doing well, who's not doing well, and what behaviors are doing because it's so um, uh, challenged by, uh, by the crisis we're going through. But I would say the signs were very positive on, uh, on scoop and, uh, and short distance carpooling in the US. So that might be the, the entry door. One last one before I turn it back over to Kevin to wrap up here. You you said something that I think I understand is true in France, but I think almost anyone outside of France or at least a few European countries would would raise their eyebrows at. You said fantasize about SNCF buying blah, blah, car, not blah, blah, car buying assets from SNCF. And the idea, you know, coming from America of having a government institution being innovative enough to actually be uh, acquisitive is absolutely foreign. But I realize it's not a uniquely... SNCF thing. Um, I remember, you know, a few years ago, I was in Paris to meet with uh, RATP um, and found out that they had sold a lot of their technology and their operational expertise to much of the Francophone region uh, and all over running public transit networks all around the world. And the idea of, you know, New York City Metro, uh, you know, franchising our operations is just comical. So like, I, I, this is kind of a wider cultural question. What is it about, you know, France and your guys kind of system of entrepreneurship that, uh, makes that actually a, a realistic a- acquisitive path. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe when I say fantasize, it was not in a, maybe I was, I was misleading you. I mean, it was not, it, it was not my dream to be, uh, to be acquired by SNCF. I would say it's, it's within the, the range of possible because it's a massive company with a massive balance sheet. So, so in theory, it's possible. In, in practice, SNCF is never going to go and buy a company like Blah Blah Car because it's, it's, a, it's subsidized by, uh, by taxpayers. I mean, they don't do this big M&A. So, so in reality, it's not even in the realm of, uh, of possible and we never even entertained the, uh, the discussion. But you know, people would have expected like SNCF to buy stuff from Blah Blah Car or buy Blah Blah Car in the early days rather than Blah Blah Car buying stuff from SNCF feels... Um, feels um, uh, a, a, bit, a bit awkward. Talking maybe more broadly about the, the European and specifically the French ecosystem, um, you know, I mean, clearly it has improved a lot in the last, uh, in the last five years. So, so I think, and you know, obviously there is lots of funding everywhere in the US and in China, uh, but, but Europe has done fairly well, I would say, catching up. And there was a lot of catching up to do. France within Europe has done pretty well uh, and uh, the government and Macron clearly pushed for that. So I think he's been pretty proactive at trying to attract talent to attract capital in France. So France has sort of like closed the gap with, uh, with most countries in, uh, in Europe. In fact, it's maybe been one of the leading places today um, in terms of, uh, of um, venture funding. Uh, yet, I think if you take a step back, Europe is still pretty far behind uh, US and China in terms of like you know, building these like massive companies and uh, you know, 10, 10 plus billion valuation and so on and so on. I mean, you see a lot of that from China, a lot of that from the US. I mean, you're still counting these companies uh, in, in Europe. So I, you, I hope uh, that you know, the, the current crisis we're going through is not going to slow down the momentum we have in Europe because the truth is we have lots of catching up to do. Uh, and it's not just France, it's really Europe in general has a lot of catching up to do on, on technology. I mean, to me, uh, you having spent uh, a lot of time in uh, in Silicon Valley and then uh, in London, it feels like in Europe, um, politicians just discovered a couple of years ago that tech matters. Uh, and if it, there was a news just recently, I think it was last week, a couple of weeks ago, that the valuation of Apple is as big as the French index uh, composed of 40 different companies. So we which is the CAC 40, which is like L'Oreal and Total and so on. The sum of that index, the French stock index, is equal uh, now a bit smaller than Apple, right? So technology does matter, um, and uh, and you know, Europe is waking up to that fact a bit late, but but at least it's uh, it's I would say it's on the right track. But uh, but we need probably, uh, and I'm going sidetrack a bit, but we need actually uh, smarter regulation in Europe if we want to push more technology in Europe. I think today, most of the regulations in Europe are a bit naive around technology. A uh, uh, couple of quick points from me then, uh, Nicolas, before we wrap up. I mean, mm -hmm. we haven't mentioned that you didn't actually start out as the CEO. You are now the CEO. I mean, talk to us a little bit about that yep. transition and um, uh, Presumably, it was a position that you were happy to take because you're sat here in front of us as the CEO. But you know, it's yeah. quite a, it's it, it is quite a leap to take. What was it an ambition or was it a natural thing for you want to want to do that? No, it was it was sort of a natural evolution of our roles uh, within the company. So, so obviously, we started by Car as three co-founders, uh, and until 2016, essentially, uh, we managed Baba Car as like a, a team of three. So essentially we were the three founders, we were uh, three of the board members, we were three shareholders, but we were also the executive committee of Babacar. So essentially any operational tactical decision was taken by us three together. Uh, we realized though that um, around 2016, that as the company grew, it became pretty inefficient as a model. So essentially it was like, essentially it was like a, a tripod of three founders splitting the company in three. And you know, Fred was managing product communication. I was managing international finance, marketing. Francis was managing technology. So it was kind of this split of skills and what we like to do. Um, but we had no executive committee. So we were really structured as the founders. The, the, those three guys were taking all the decision. In 2016, we realized we need to formalize the world a bit more. Uh, and we need to formalize like a CEO role and built like a real executive team with like a COO, CFO, and so on and so on. 
Um, and that's what we decided to do in 2016. So it's actually been more of a, a natural transition, actually. So, so it, from the outside, it feels like, oh, wow, okay, big change, change of CEO. In fact, it was more of a, a natural evolution between the three of us, um, where my job did not really change overnight. And, uh, and Fred and Francis actually uh, stayed for quite some time and phased out very gradually. Uh, and right now, they're still obviously founders, they're still board members, they're still shareholders, we still have uh, founder meetings actually uh, every month. But from a, an execution point of view, I'm the CEO, I have my executive team, and, uh, and that's how I make, uh, I, I make sort of the daily decisions, if you like. And you're the one who gets to come along and do podcasts like this with us, which is, uh, which is, which is great. So a uh, quick one then. Um, a lot of people might not know this, but what is the, what is the story behind the name? I think it's, it's a great story and the reason why, but yeah. there, there, there'll be many people that are tuning in who don't know the reason why you are called blah, blah. Yeah, blah. And yeah, two, two small anecdotes actually on, uh, on that. So, so we started as, uh, as something called covoiturage.fr, uh, which again, it's carpooling dot com which was great because it says what it does uh so from a seo point of view it's easy and, uh, and people don't at least understand what what the product is supposed to do but it's very weak because a you cannot go international obviously so you have to stay in france with such a name um, and b even if it was not the case descriptors are very weak brands so like it's like being called a car if you're a car no you call like bmw or something else um, so we decided to change and, um, and back then actually we had well, no idea how to, to name this thing and not much money. Uh, and, and we, every time I was using the product, I was asking people like, okay, what product have you used? Because back then there were like uh, lots of carpooling website with tiny classified doing that. And people were always like, oh yeah, yeah, I used the uh, website called uh, carpooling something or e-carpooling something and they could never <laughs> spell the name. And then I asked them, like, okay, what was the color of the logo? And like blue, green, red, they never remembered that. But they always remembered, like, hey, that's the, uh, the service where whenever, when, I, when I sign up, actually they ask me if I'm talkative or not, and I have to choose within my profile a blah, blah index. So I need to, to decide if I'm a blah, and I don't want to talk in the car, if I'm blah, blah, because I'm normal, if I'm blah, 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 and it's all about social. And we were really, like, literally, we've put that feature and that blah, blah as just something. Like, it was not even put through back then. It was just a, a thing. We had, like, smoking, non-smoking, pet, no pet, and we had blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, and people remember that. So, uh, and, and I can discuss that. We thought, like, that's really interesting. Like, they don't remember the name. They don't remember the color. They cannot give you, like, the URL. They cannot give you anything except that one feature that's almost anecdotal in the entire flow of booking, booking a ride, but it seems so important. So, so we thought, okay, because it's so much about social uh, experience in a way, and, and this blah, blah is, is a nice breaker of social discomfort in a way. Uh, yeah. We thought, okay, that has to be part of the name and the story. Um, and we changed that to, to, to blah, blah car. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember like one pitch with um, a, a, a VC, I won't name. Um, when we renamed that blah, blah car, he said like, well, with such a name, you're never going to be a billion dollar company. And uh, <laughs> I guess we have. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but anyway, so, so that's the story, uh, the story about the name. But that's also just maybe in, uh, in 10 sec. That's also the beauty of, of that service. You know, I was describing that as we work on trust and connection and not on the transport network. Yeah. But Black Black Car is enabling actually millions of people to connect for two, three, four hours when in fact they were not meant to be connected. So, so we end up, you know, socially they were not meant to, to talk, to connect and, and within the social media, they probably have like very different feed on Facebook and Twitter and so on, um, you know, Pinterest or whatever. Um, so it's, it's very interesting because it's, it's a massive social experiment where, especially in those sort of political tense days um, where you put like three, four people together with very different political views. And we've run a survey, I'll, um, and people can go check that, which is fascinating, where we see that 80 plus percent of users say that blah, blah, was an enriching experience. Clearly, you would not say that of taking a plane or a train. 50% uh, of people say they change their mind on something, taking a blah, blah car. And even crazier, 20% of people say 
they revealed something, some kind of like a secret, quote unquote, um, in a blah, blah car that they have not told their friend. Um, <laughs> and, and, it's, and we've done that on like tens of thousands of, uh, of people surveyed in 10 different countries. Um, and the reason people do that is if you think of a blah, blah car, you, you end up spending like three, four hours with someone you probably won't meet again. Um, you end up talking for three, four hours. It's a long time. It's like a lot longer than the podcast. It's, it's a very long time to, to talk to, to someone. And you're not facing each other in a car. So you, you just like, you're looking at the road, just like at the shrink. Uh, and, uh, and people tend to go off and, and, and tell, uh, tell amazing stories. So anyway, so, so I would say that's the, the, the beauty of the service is obviously the environmental impact, but also that social element. Yeah. Uh, where well, you, you connect people, not meant to, to be connected. Well, certainly, blah, blah, car is a lot catchier than psychotherapy car, isn't it? I suppose. <laughs> exactly. No, no, yeah, so indeed. Well, okay, right. That, that was great. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that was another really great interview and uh, great episode of How I Got Here. These are Mozio and FocusWise uh, weekly podcast interviews with entrepreneurs and innovators in travel and transportation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you're not a subscriber, you can do so on all the usual platforms. That's iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, Alexa, and Google Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review. Uh, we always like to hear your feedback and uh, see people give us lots of great ratings. So thank you very much in advance for those. Thanks again to Nicholas. And I'm behalf of david and i thank you very much for listening to how i got here we'll see you next time thanks a lot thanks for listening to how i got here podcast we'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages and get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com see you next week